All right. Welcome. Welcome, everyone. Welcome, Kathy. How are you doing? Great. Thanks, Damien. How are you? <laughs> I'm doing fantastic. Was looking forward to our chat today. Uh, let me give a, a shout to our attendees. So far, Ahmed, Alexandros, Anastasia, Eleonora, George, Christian, Iris, John, Mohamed, Panagiotis, Peggy, Stamatis, Zabika, Takis, Vasilios, and Vasilis. Uh, we have our chats coming in. Hello, everyone. So nice to see you. Uh, as uh, most of our events, we are going to have a conversation with uh, Kathy today. And uh, if you have any questions along the way, please ask them in the Q&A box, not the chat box you're using right now. So ask them in the Q&A and uh, we'll do our best to address all your questions, thoughts, suggestions, whatever it is. All righty. I guess, Kathy, it's okay with you uh, to start? Yeah, sure. Hi, everybody. Thanks for the invitation to be here, Damien. It's nice to be talking about all things job search related. So I'm a career coach. I'm based in Ireland. So I work primarily with people in Ireland um, remotely. So I work on Zoom with people all around Ireland. And it's usually for people who are looking for guidance with career direction. I also help people with job search applications and interview preparation as well. Um, I actually started my career in career guidance in the UK. So I worked in a higher education institute there for three years, um, mostly actually with people in finance and economics. Um, but I guess job search strategies are by and large similar across different industries. Um, and since relocating back to Ireland, I freelance in a university here near me while also um, starting my own uh, private career coaching business. Okay, okay. H how long have you been doing this? So I started career coaching in 2016. Okay, okay. So it has been a good six years. Uh, would you uh, like to share what you were doing before and how come you transitioned to this, uh, to this uh, work? Yeah, sure. So I guess I started my career in finance and economics. Um, mm -hmm. So I did an undergraduate degree in finance and economics and went on to specialize in the master's in finance. I thought that's the way I was going to do go. So I did a couple of different internships in investment banking and corporate finance. I got a graduate role as a stock trader. Um, and then I kind of decided, OK, no, finance isn't for me. It's not going to make me happy in the long term. So I switched track and I'd always thought that I'd like to get into academia. And um, so I brought that plan forward a little bit. So I went off and did two years as a research economist um in the UC in UCD in Dublin and then I went off to do a PhD in economics at University College London in the UK um, and I got a job as a research economist at the Bank of England um, but only stayed there for a few months because I just had my first kid and again it was a kind of a fairly full-on job and I had a fairly full-on kid at home so I was like something has to kind of give here but like also, I mean, looking at the long term as well, I kind of decided that, you know, academic research was probably not that well suited to me. Like you tend to be involved in very long term projects. And I wanted to be working on work where you kind of saw the, the impact of your work more quickly. And um, so, yeah, so that kind of what started that transition and retrained as a career advisor. And I've been, as you said, very happy doing that since. So and here I am. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, fascinating. Uh, it looks like you're living your second life uh, through this career. Do you, uh, you mentioned something very important, the long term and the ha happiness. Do you find yourself uh, more happy? I I'm not sure how to define it or like how to measure it, but what, what would you say about this question? I think you want different things out of your career at different stages. Um, so for me, and, and everybody's different, um, but for me, since I had kids, I definitely valued having a really good work-life balance and, and not having a very stressful job. It's something that was really important to me. Um, but, you know, at the same time, when I was doing economics, I really enjoyed it too. So, you know what I mean? It's not like I regret what I did beforehand. It, you know, it, it gave me a lot for that period of my life as well. Um, and even, you know, when I talk to clients now, I say, I'm not going to be doing this forever either. You know what I mean? So this is something that suits me for now. 
but I've got 30 plus years of work left and I don't think I'm going to be doing this exact role for 30 years more. So, yeah, it's that kind of flexible way, I think, of looking at your career and how it might evolve over over your lifetime. I, I read this book called, I think, Life 2.0 which describes the concept of like we don't have a career for 45 years anymore we have to be jumping from career to career uh, all the time and uh, it's it's a fascinating read for anyone interested uh, so we are here to talk about creating a job search strategy uh, what would you say should be the mindset of the person starting to develop uh, such a strategy yeah, I think it can be really difficult um, when you're going through a job search process. I think there can be a lot of emotions involved in it, a lot of stress and anxiety. And I think if you can support yourself through that process to have a positive mindset and, and to be kind of keeping things in balance, I think it's it's a really good way to approach it. Um, I don't know if you've ever watched the Sean Acker TED Talk. Um, it's called The Happy Secret to Better Work, but it's one of my favorite TED Talks. He's really engaging. He's a really funny guy. Um, but he talks about research that shows, you know, when you're in a happy state, when you're optimistic, you're much more productive and outcomes are more positive. So I think that if you apply that to job search as well, if you can have a positive mindset and if you can be optimistic in that process, you know, the research would suggest that you're more likely to have a positive outcome. Um, and you're going to be more productive in that job search. Um, so I think that that's one, like that's my takeaway from that. Um, and, and, you know, I think it's it's not just saying, oh, just be happy, right? I mean, you know, you can't, you can't just be happy. But, but I wish it was that easy. Yeah, I really wish <laughs> it was like, yes, I want to be happier now. Let's do it. <laughs> but, but there are some tools there from positive psychology that you can use. So mm -hmm. there's, for example, the ABCDE model of learned optimism. And that's a way of kind of looking at how you're you're perceiving a task or an event in your life. And it's a way of kind of trying to be a bit more, you know, optimistic or at least not pessimistic in terms of how you're inter interpreting and maybe approaching some things in your life. Um, and there's also the concept of reframing, which is like if you're seeing something that's really negative, it's maybe kind of reinterpreting how you're you're viewing that life event. I think there are two tools from positive psychology that can potentially be applied to this situation to help support people through it. Um, and I think anything else you can do as well in terms of, you know, some people get a lot of enjoyment from being creative or from exercising and, and eating well and stuff like that. So I think that there's other things that we can look at kind of holistically to support ourselves through these transitions, which can be quite challenging and emotionally fraught. <laughs> Oh, uh, we, we find it, uh, we, we talk a lot with our students and uh, they really find it very hard to be motivated because, you know, imposter syndrome uh, shows up. How, how would you suggest uh, uh, to, to, to deal with the imposter syndrome? Well, I think it's good to recognize it as imposter syndrome, right? I mean, like mm -hmm. you can say, okay, this is a common thing that lots of people experience at this stage of their career. So I think often just recognizing it as such can be one step in, in kind of addressing it. Um, I mean, I think the other thing is like, as you get more experience, you do get more confidence. So if there's ways that you can look at building up your skill set or your experience or whatever it might be, that will be adding to your confidence as you go through that process. And it doesn't have to be paid work, right? I mean, there's other things that you can do, like projects or or volunteering that can kind of help, I think, with that confidence and help alleviate that imposter syndrome. Um, and I think another thing, and, and it'll probably come up a couple of times as we go through this conversation, is the value of networking um, and talking to other people about their experiences. Because you can you can learn from other people, right? And you can say, how did you feel when you started in this industry? And you'll probably hear that nine people out of 10 felt the same way as you felt. And maybe they'd be able to share like coping strategies that they use or just reassure you that it is very normal to feel that. And, you know, as, as time goes on, you'll, you'll kind of gain confidence as you develop within that role. Ah, uh, yes, networking. Uh, it can be very daunting, especially for young professionals. Uh, I think as you move along your career, it 
you kind of acknowledge it as a thing that mm -hmm. like it or not it's something that you need to do and you uh, just do it but uh, at least in the beginning of my career it was really really scary uh, especially back then in like offline events mm -hmm. all the time because to, uh, at least right now you can also network online which is maybe just a tad easier Mm -hmm. uh how how would you go about uh for for a young professional because most of the participants mm -hmm. today uh, most of them it's like the the beginning of their career uh how what would be the strategy for them to mm -hmm. start networking well, one thing i think it's good to do is to be intentional about your networking right so like you don't just network just to network right I mean, it's, it's like, why are you doing that? And, and what's the motivation behind why you're reaching out to these people? Because I think that can help guide what you do, right? Not everybody has to go up to two meetups every week and, and meet as many people as you can, right? I mean, that doesn't suit some people and it's not necessarily going to be useful um, if, if it's not intentional. So I think the first thing is to sit down and say, okay, what am I networking for? What do I want to get out of this? And then who are the correct people to approach and how can I approach those people? So like, let's say, for example, you, um, you know, you want to learn about what it's like to work in a particular company, right? I mean, you want to find a way of, of identifying and reaching out to people in that company and explain to them that you'd like to have a chat about what working at, let's say, Google is like, for example, right? So that kind of is, it's a very clear strategy there. You're, you're going to try and find somebody in Google, you're going to reach out to them, say you'd like a quick 15 minute chat to learn what working at Google is about, right? So, you know, I think that takes a lot of the uncertainty and the vagueness and the lack of motivation away from networking, right? Because you're very intentional. You're like, right, I know exactly what I'm doing here. Um, yeah, so I think, that's one thing I think is really important to be intentional. Um, I think the other thing is it is intimidating, I think, when you start networking, no matter how you do it. Um, you know, I, I when I worked with students at the start, I used to always be like, oh, yeah, just, you know, reach out to these people on LinkedIn and, and get talking to them. It's fine. And then I moved back to Ireland. Right. And I was trying to reestablish myself as a career professional. And I was reaching out to people and I was like, oh, my God, this is actually the first time I've done this myself. And it is daunting. You know, I've been saying it for years. I'll just drop them an email on LinkedIn. Um, but but I think, you know, again, if you kind of go into it with a, you know, a relatively positive state of mind and you say, in my experience, right, if somebody can help you and you're asking for something easy, by and large, people will respond positively to that. Not everybody will, right? I mean, not everybody in LinkedIn reads their emails. Not everybody has time or capacity to help you. So, you know, you kind of say, okay, I'm not putting all my eggs in one basket, but maybe you try reach out to somebody, you hope that you hear back from them, and if not, you kind of move on, right? And um, so I think that's the other thing. It's, it's about kind of having that belief that if a person can help and you've made an easy ask, hopefully they, they will be able to get back to you and help you. And I think there's some other kind of guidelines as well in terms of, like, let's say it's LinkedIn. Um, you know, I think if you can find commonality with people, that's a real positive as well. So, for example, let's say some of the alumni from the Social Hackers Academy have gone on to work in Google. If you can find some of these guys to reach out to, for example, and, you you know, in your introductory email, you can say, hey, you know, we both started out in the same place or, you know, I'm sure we have some of the lectures in common or whatever it is. You know, immediately you've, you've kind of put in place some commonality there and the person is going, it's going to resonate with them, right? And they're more likely to say, oh yeah, sure, I can hop on a 15 minute chat, no problem. Yeah, we, we actually have this happening more often than we mm -hmm. thought ever would happen of mm -hmm. uh, alumni inviting uh, other alumni into their companies. They, they now are managers and they recruit people directly. So, so yeah, mm -hmm. networking between the alumni alone can mm -hmm. be an easy, and maybe also an easy first step, you know, to get mm -hmm. to get the ball rolling, uh, get, yeah. get some attention. Um, uh, talking about uh, job search, uh, how how someone starts starts a plan? Like, is there such a thing? Like, you have a plan on, in your job search? I think it can. Like in the same way that we talked about kind of being intentional in terms of networking, I think you can also be quite intentional in terms of your job search. So I'm assuming that most of your students have an idea of the type of jobs that they're targeting. Right? I know you guys do a lot of like full stack development and Java development and so on. So I'm assuming that most people kind of have an idea of what job they're going for. Um, but I think it's worth sitting down, like say with a piece of paper. Well, 
Okay, let's talk a little bit about time boxing first, right? I talk to a lot of clients who are there scrolling on their phone every evening for hours looking through jobs and they're not doing anything about it, right? It's such a, I, I, I think it's such a waste of time. They're not retaining any information from it. It's not a useful use of time. So I think it can be quite useful to sit down and say, okay, how long do I want to spend each week on job search, right? It might, for example, be two sessions a week for an hour, right? And you actually sit down and you put it into your calendar and you say, this is the time I'm going to do focused job search and the rest of the time, I'm doing my creative stuff. I'm going for a run. I'm, you know, I'm doing other things to support myself or, or being productive or volunteering or whatever it is. So I think that's one thing that can be really helpful. I think the other thing is sitting down with a piece of paper and saying, OK, I want to be a developer. <laughs> right. So it's about writing down all the different titles that people have doing that job, right? So you can have a full stack developer, you can have a front end, you can have a back end, you can have a JavaScript developer, you can have Python, I don't know what other kind of languages you guys learn, but there's lots of different terms that can be kind of used for very similar roles that your students might be targeting. So it's also about writing down the list of, of search terms that you can use for relevant jobs for you. Um, also, like if you're if you guys are entry level, right? It can also be worth putting things like junior or entry level or trainee as part of that search term because you're going to be finding jobs that are more relevant for you and being more effective in that job search as well. And um, so that's one thing. Yeah, it's kind of OK. So having the time set out in your calendar and I think being a bit diligent about that. Secondly, it's about knowing what titles you're looking for. Um, and then I think it's a bit about knowing where the places are to go to look for these jobs, right? Um, and I know you've got students like from all over the world, so obviously it'll be different yeah. <laughs> depending. Um, it'll be, so it'll be different depending on what country you're based in. <clears throat> Sorry, excuse me, frog my throat. But typically there's a couple of good like job aggregator websites, right, where they're kind of, you know, they're scanning the web for for different jobs and they're kind of pulling them all together. So, for example, Indeed, I know, are, are kind of global and can be found in lots of different um, countries. So Indeed is an example of that. And um, LinkedIn, is, it, I think it's not so much a job aggregator because people are actually putting jobs up there. But there's a lot of jobs, for example, on LinkedIn as well. They're kind of very broad job search websites. Um, so job aggregators are a good place to go. Um, also, like if you're looking like within the tech industry, for example, there might be niche websites that you should be aware of, again, within your country that advertise for IT roles. Um, and I think that can be a good thing to, to become aware of. And you can find that out even just by Googling, right? Like what are the main IT like job search websites in yeah. India yeah. or UK or wherever it is? Um, and also, like, you know, again, like like we said with the alumni piece, talk to each other. Right. I mean, like other students would have probably useful information for you guys. So you can you can you can talk amongst yourselves. You can talk to alumni. You can reach out to people if you are doing that on LinkedIn. Ask them how they find their jobs. Right. There's lots of things we can do there about, um, you know, figuring out how to find jobs. The other thing I would say, OK, so we talked about job aggregators. We talked about IT specific websites. There's also like lots of niche websites all over the place advertising jobs, right? And, and I'm sure this is the case in all countries, right? But if I take Ireland, for example, right? Lots of the clients I want to work, I work with, want to work in the public sector, right? In the civil service. There's a civil service specific job site website and those jobs don't turn up anywhere else almost, right? They don't turn up in Indeed. They don't turn up on LinkedIn. So if you don't go to that website, you don't see any of them, right? And there are IT jobs, for example, advertised there as well. Similarly, the the kind of the main the health service within Ireland have their own job search website. It doesn't turn up on the, the public sector website, doesn't turn up on Indeed, doesn't turn up on LinkedIn. So if you don't know about it, you don't see jobs advertised. And there's loads of IT jobs that go up in that space as well, for example. So it's it's a bit about being kind of creative almost in that job search as well and, and thinking about where these pockets of opportunities are advertised. Because the really cool thing about, like, for example, the health service IT roles is that not everybody in the whole world is seeing them, right? Because they're not turning up in any of these other job aggregators' websites. So there's less competition probably for those, those job vacancies, right? 
very interesting point. I've, I've never thought about uh, NIS, NIS websites. Uh, uh, I have a question, but before that, I would like to, to bring a fact. I don't remember the exact number, but something like 60% of jobs don't get advertised on the big like websites. They go uh, word of mouth, they get covered from friend to friend, they have internal networks that they leverage, and uh, maybe there are these uh, these websites that you mentioned. I, I would like to go to the concept of time boxing, which is something I, I use quite a lot personally mm -hmm. to increase my productivity. Uh, for for someone, let's say, who is uh, an entry level uh, potential web developer, how much time do you think they should be investing into the actual research of uh, of the job hunt? I think it depends massively. Like I wouldn't tell anybody, you know, this length of time. Um, I mean, I honestly, but I, at the same time, I think it sounds sensible to do two blocks of one to two hours a week. Um, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? You're still going to be seeing, like, you know, if you're doing it twice a week, you're going to be seeing jobs that are, you know, they're, you know, pretty up to date. It's not that they've been posted a whole week ago if you're doing it every couple of days. Um, and yeah, one to two hours a week, I feel is is kind of reasonable. But I think everybody probably has to find their own comfort level within that. Maybe some people don't have two to four hours a week to spend on job search. Maybe people, you know, are are, are really eager to get a job quicker than that. And maybe they mm -hmm. feel like it's, more, it's worthwhile them spending, you know, more time on it. Mm -hmm. But I mean, if I was to ask, like, say a rule of thumb, I would probably say about two hours a week, twice a week, That like one to two hours twice a week. That's probably what, if it was me, I would aim for. Okay. Okay. Uh, and in this uh, two to four hours weekly uh, is it just the searching the applying creating customized cover letters which i, I would love to talk about it mm -hmm. is like the whole job search in this two to four hours right um yeah i guess look it totally depends on the person right and it depends on how much time they have to give it um mm -hmm. But like when it comes to applying, I think it makes sense to put in fewer high quality applications than the other way around. Mm -hmm. um, so that means, yeah, you have to definitely build in time for making those tailored applications. And, and again, look, there's no rule. Of, like I wouldn't actually give a rule of thumb for this. Right. So but, but like if you're applying for like one job a week, say you probably need a couple of hours to put into that application. Right. I mean, you know, you want to be tailoring your material. If there's an online application form, you want to be putting the time and effort into that. Same with a cover letter. Um, I mean, I think you get quicker with these things over time. But, but I do think, you know, especially if you're not finding that many roles within your niche, I think you definitely want to be putting time into making those applications pretty strong. I see. Uh, okay, so we have uh, blocked the time to, to do the job searching. Uh, we know what titles we want to apply for. We found the websites, the NIS uh, website or the aggregate or the big uh, job at, uh, job boards. Uh, what what are the next steps? What uh, what should we do next? Okay, so other things. One of the things we didn't really talk about in terms of looking for jobs is also having a list of like target companies potentially. So again, I often talk to people and they have a couple of dream organizations or organizations that really appeal to them for whatever reason. Maybe it's about their geographical location. Maybe it's about the type of work they do. Maybe it's about the benefits on offer. Who knows? But if you have a list of target companies as well, factor that into your like your time boxing, right? That you're going onto those companies' websites to do job search on them. For example, like the likes of Google and pretty much all companies, right? They'll have their own internal job vacancy website. And again, I know I keep going back to picking on poor old Google, but, um, you know, they don't advertise their jobs anywhere else because they have such a high volume of internal applications. They don't need yeah. to. They're already getting swamped with people who want to work there. So, you know, if you want to work, work for Google, I wouldn't be hanging out on LinkedIn waiting for them to advertise their role. Right. I'd be going to their website and seeing what jobs are popping up. And also sometimes these companies, not all of them. Right. But some of their job sports will also allow you to sign up for job alerts. And that can be mm -hmm. worth doing as well, right? Because you're not having to go back to the website, but they will email you if a job comes up with it, with the parameters that you're interested in. So yeah, that's just another thing to kind of throw into that mix. Okay, okay. Uh, the the job alerts, uh, uh, is it like how 
Sorry, I lost my train of thought. It's okay, it's been late for you guys, sorry. <laughs> yeah, 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 the job alert. Yes, 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 so the job alert. Uh, do you set it with specific parameters? I'm not I'm not familiar with this concept. Uh, mm -hmm. Do you, like, I'm looking for entry level mm -hmm. in Greece and it gives you the, the updated results, I guess, along the way? That's how it works? So I don't know about all websites, to be fair, but for example, yeah. on LinkedIn, yeah. yes, you can be quite specific with your, your search terms. So like on LinkedIn, and I just did this beforehand, so that I should probably know. <laughs> but mm -hmm. yeah, like if you put in, for example, a job title and a location and entry level, and you put that into your, your search in LinkedIn and you hit set job alert, it'll remember those parameters. So in LinkedIn, okay. certainly you can be quite specific about it. Like other companies, I think it will very much depend. Like there should definitely be some functionality built in. Like you don't want to be emailed about all their jobs and they'll know that that would be annoying for people. So like your best practices would for you, for you to be able to set some filters. So for example, for me, I should be able to filter for Irish jobs within Google or, you know, within this division, for example. And um, so, yeah, you think that most of them would offer some level of kind of um, filtering of job alerts. Okay. Uh, what is uh, talking about LinkedIn? I I, lo I absolutely love LinkedIn. Mm -hmm. I use it every day. Not as a job hunter. I've never actually used it as a job hunter, mm -hmm. but I love the new features they're bringing all, all the time. So let's say I find a, a job post I really like. I uh, okay. I figure out the CV and the the cover letter. What's the etiquette in reaching out to the recruiter? Should I be reaching out to the recruiter? Is it expected? Is like what's how should I approach? Uh, because I want to stand out in in some way. Mm -hmm. Is this a proper way to uh, to stand out? So I I'm only going to give my opinion. Okay, so other career advisors might say different things. I personally wouldn't if it was me. Um, I wouldn't reach out to a recruiter for a job that's open unless I had specific questions about it, right? So, you know, sometimes you'll see a job advertisement and there'll be a contact name for if you have kind of questions or kind of informal queries about it. Like, so for example, let's say a job was advertised and I want to know if it was part-time. Um, I might reach out and have a conversation with the recruitment. Like, you know, if it was a deal breaker for me, for example, if it wasn't part-time, I might reach out and have that conversation before I spend lots of time doing my application materials, for example. Or, for example, if I needed visa sponsorship, I might reach out and ask, you know, and say, like, I'm looking really interested in this role. Just wondering, will you consider sponsoring a visa for this position? Again, I don't want to waste loads of time, you know, putting an application in if it's going to go straight into the bin. And um, so so there are some exceptions, but generally I wouldn't reach out. And look, I know lots of lots of other career coaches on LinkedIn are saying it's a good thing to do. You know, you get noticed personally. And I don't know if it's it's an Irish kind of um like a more of a kind of a norm, but personally, yeah, mm. I wouldn't. Um, I mean, I think like, again, if there was a company that you were particularly interested in working for, like, you know, you can always reach out to other people who aren't the recruiter, right? So you can reach out to other people who are in the IT development team and say, look, I'm really interested in working for this organization, love to learn a bit more about it. So you're reaching out to other team members potentially, but not necessarily the recruitment manager. Um, and you're learning other things about, you know, the organization and the opportunity. Um, and in terms of the long, like the long game as well, you know, if you're making these connections with people and they think that you're good, they might refer you for roles internally, which again, I think is, you're more likely to, like the recruiter is more likely to pay attention to people who have been referred internally as well. Um, so that would probably rather, that would be my approach, but I know not all career coaches would agree with that. <clears throat> I, I see. Okay. Okay. Uh, I, I got it. Uh, all right. Uh, about uh, talking about uh, earlier about CV and cover letter, uh, do do you think the the way to go is to customize customize it specifically for every uh, job advertisement? How would that work? And mm -hmm. uh, and what are the things you need to be changing mm -hmm. in uh, okay, in your cover letter? I don't know. I think it makes more sense to customize it. Like in the CV, how can like can you really do that? Uh, it's time or should you be doing it? Yeah, so, you know, on LinkedIn, right, if there's a job advertised on LinkedIn, there's this quick apply button. I would mm -hmm. usually recommend people don't do that, like avoid it like the plague, because if you do that, like it's so easy for people to do, right? I mean, like they're getting so, you can see when a job's been advertised, like four hours later, they've received 50 applications. You're like, 
what? Um, whereas if you go to that company's website, often those jobs will be advertised internally and there'll be a different application process. I would always recommend that you go and look at what they're asking for there because you're you're kind of like you're showing to the recruiter that you're really interested, you're motivated, you've gone through their internal processes. I think you're more likely to get noticed. Um, so before you tailor your CV and spend hours doing a cover letter, I'd get onto their job site and see what they're looking for. Some companies will just ask for an application form. Some will ask for an application form and a CV and a cover letter. So there's different combinations of things that they look for. Before you waste all your time, go and check and see what they're looking for. Um, when it comes to tailoring, yeah, always I would always tailor your cover letter and your CV if necessary. Um, I mean, I, I totally agree with what you're saying. You know, if your students are applying for full stack developer um, roles, by and large, 90% of the job spec is going to be the same. But there's always nuances in a job description mm. in terms of what they're looking for and their experience. And so you might want to tweak it a little bit and, you know, you know, put different emphasis on different things in your CV. I think, you know, as time goes, you'll, you'll get really quick at that. And, you know, you'll have probably a pretty strong CV that you don't need to make huge changes to. Mm -hmm. But personally, if it was me, it comes back to putting in fewer, higher quality applications. Mm -hmm. And there's kind of two big reasons for that, Damien, right? One is because when a recruiter looks at your CV, you're immediately ticking their boxes, right? Mm -hmm. Like, you know, you put, the, you put the information in a way that's really quick for them to scan, read and go, yes, 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 they have everything we need. Secondly, the recruiter can see that you've put in that effort, right? So they're also like looking and seeing the motivation there as well. So, so that's the two reasons that, that I think it's it's worthwhile. Okay, it's it's really their job. Like they know their job very well. They go through CVs very fast. They have, they say like six seconds to scan through the, the CV mm -hmm. and every little uh, effort that you put Mm -hmm. might differentiate you from other people who didn't put the effort and the recruiters, mm -hmm. they know. They they yeah. really they really know. That's their job. Mm -hmm. uh, alrighty. Uh, during the, the job search and looking for companies and such, do you suggest to for the people to have some kind of CRM, uh, like, like a spreadsheet that they manage uh, where they apply, how they applied, any, anything like that? Um, yeah, I think it makes sense. I mean, I've never talked to anybody who has an Excel sheet, but I like that level of organization. <laughs> um, <laughs> I mean, actually, that's not totally true. I know when people are applying for graduate schemes, often they can mm -hmm. be that organized because there can be an, a lot that they're applying for in a year and there's different application mm -hmm. deadlines and stuff. So I have seen people use spreadsheets for that type of thing. But yeah, I mean, it totally makes sense, right? I mean, it's useful to remember the names of people that you've spoken to and Mm. and what roles you applied for and what dates. Yeah, I definitely think it, it makes sense to do that. I mean, another thing I would say as well is, you know, if I was applying for lots of different applications and sending in different versions of cover letters and CVs, I'd also save on my computer, like different folders for the different roles that I applied for and the application material that I sent in. Because if you get called to interview, you want to know <laughs> what, what, um, what like information the recruiter has in front of them and you'd like to be looking at mm. the same information ideally yourself beforehand. Yeah. So it's nice to save a version of the application material that you sent in and same actually for application forms. So, you know, if you're, you're applying on a, on a system, you can often do a print view of the application form that you've kind of put in. So I would always recommend doing that as well. All right, all right. Uh, great, great. Uh, maybe it's just me. I'm I'm a big believer in spreadsheets. Uh, so, oh, I love it. so yeah. <laughs> I'll be telling all my clients to do it now. I'll be like, you should start a spreadsheet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, not for everyone, I guess, but it's nice, especially if you put if you really put the effort mm -hmm. to create the customized CVs and cover letters, you might as well do this extra step to really know. Mm -hmm. And then uh, make it easier maybe to follow up, reach out, like whatever whatever the next step is. Uh, talking about the next step. So you found a job that really you really like in a company. You understand how they work. Uh, you send a CV and nothing happens. Uh, how? Uh, what would you suggest the, the applicant to do after that? Yeah, so I think like, again, look, I think in different countries, there might be different norms. Like it's very standard 
in Ireland and I think the UK if you've applied to get um, like a kind of receipt of application so you'll often get an email or often automated saying yeah. thank you for your application we've received your application materials um, and also I mean it's pretty usual I guess to hear back within like two weeks of kind of the ex like after the closing date two weeks after the closing date would be that kind of expected window to hear back from people I think if you haven't heard back within that window, you can absolutely send like a polite email, obviously, to the, the recruitment manager, um, you know, if you have their contact details. And again, in that like email or whatever it is, I'd re-express your, um, your interest in that role. Uh, you know, obviously be very polite and kind of enthusiastic in terms of how you're, you're approaching the HR team. But yeah, just ask, you know, whether they have any feedback or, or you know, whether, you know, your application is going to be progressed to the next stage. Yeah. And uh, let's say you, you sent the, the first message. Uh, then what what is the next step? Uh, let's say they don't get back to you. What, should you follow up? Is it does it start becoming a bad like bad way like what what would you think about it i mean i guess my approach would be to send and look like there's different lots of different probably views on this right and and this is if, you know if i was working with a client i'd always ask them what their thoughts are and how they'd like to proceed so i would never tell somebody this is the way to do it i can tell you what i would do um, so I would send that follow up email and if I didn't hear back, I'd be moving on with my life. <laughs> right. Yeah. There, obviously, something is going on with their HR team, like they've stopped the role, they're overwhelmed with with applications and materials. And I'm not sure what other what more steps you can take at that stage that, that's going to reflect well on you. And that would be my mm -hmm. thought. Okay. Uh, in our case, uh, all, all our students are essentially uh, software developers and they're looking for their first job. How can they, they differentiate? Because in juniors, like, of course, the competition is much mm -hmm. bigger than, than seniors. Uh, how, how can they stand out? What, mm -hmm. what are your suggestions in that? Um, so I think there's a couple of things that you can do. Um... I think like one thing is like for, for IT people who are doing like code developing, for example, like I guess you guys use GitHub a lot or some, there might be some people who are familiar with GitHub. I think that type of platform can be a really good way to help yourself stand out because you're essentially sharing your code libraries, right? And, and recruiters can actually go in and, and see, you know, what you're capable of and see what your level of programming skill is. So I think sharing GitLab library is a really good thing to do on your CV in the same way that lots of people include their LinkedIn URL. If I was an IT software developer, I'd be including my GitLab link. Um, I also think like be creative in terms of thinking about how you can build up your CV for these roles. Like, you know, I, I know a lot of people in, in your, um, your academy would have previous life experience. If there's anything related to IT that you can talk about there or you know, like there's lots of other soft skills that are used in IT roles, things like communication, stakeholder management, um, you know, problem solving, troubleshooting, all of the attention to detail. If there's anything else that you can bring from previous experiences that is relevant and make sure you're including that and you're kind of digging into that a little bit in your in your CV as well. Um, and I think the other thing that a lot of people can do is, is volunteering. Like there's so many volunteering opportunities out there. And it's essentially yeah. like, you know, you're essentially doing the same thing as you would be in a job. So you're building up that experience and skills um, in a very similar way. And it looks really good on your CV. And look, I know not everybody has the luxury to be able to do that. But if you had even a couple of hours in your week, maybe like IT skills are in high demand, right? There's yes, so much yes. There's so That's many charities sure. out there that would like be soaking up your skills. So, so you know, I think if there's a way to kind of creatively build up your CV to exactly as you said, allow yourself mm. to stand out a little bit. Yeah, and, and and you network at the same time, and you might end up, uh, you know, if they if you build something very valuable, you might even end up uh, working there. Uh, we've seen so so much. We've had at some point uh, five people. Uh, uh, doing internships in the social enterprise, they just did it because they they liked the social mission, and uh, that social enterprise ended up getting huge funding, and they oh. hired all five of them. Uh, oh, wow. 
yeah yeah it was really <laughs> we were really excited especially this was like back in the day when it was yeah. much tougher uh yes so um, i i'm looking uh, at the time i would like to keep the last quarter for questions mm -hmm. from our attendees so everyone if you have uh, questions and thoughts suggestions please put them in the q a uh, Kathy, is there something that I haven't asked you uh, about and uh, uh, makes sense for you to mention it? Um, I'm looking, so I know we sent over some some notes about uh, things that we could talk about and just thinking about other things. I mean, just before we move on from the volunteering, it's another thing just to say, I know you said, you know, it can lead to jobs, but there's also a huge paid voluntary sector as well. So like if you were to do volunteering work within the nonprofit sector and then apply for an IT role within the nonprofit role that is paid, right? I mean, that's also a really relevant experience and they'd really value that in, like in addition. Um, I mean, there's some of the things that I thought about like that, you know, I know um, Demeter when he reached out said like, you know, you have a lot of your students, for example, um, might be asylum seekers or um, migrants into different countries as well. And there's often support programs in different countries for people in those circumstances. So I would always just make sure that you are tapping into all of the resources available to you. And um, because often there, there can be quite substantial um, you know, employment services support, for example. I know there are some in Ireland in place already. And um, so, so just to kind of look into that and make sure that all the resources that are out there that can help you, you're accessing. Yes, yes, great suggestion, uh, great suggestion, yes, and there are so many uh, NGOs out there, uh, especially mm -hmm. for the vulnerable groups we are serving, that mm -hmm. really offer very good services with very dedicated social workers who really want to help, yeah. and you get that for free, which is something not very easy <laughs> uh, yeah. to find. Yeah, exactly, and, and they can give advice as well often around kind of, you know, working rights and, and the visa situation and stuff like that for people as well. So that's the other thing I just wanted to touch on as well is that like, I worked a lot with international students in the UK and I always tried to recommend to people that people were very clear about their visa situation with employers and, and as well that you're making it really clear to employers in different countries what your qualifications are. Like, so for example, let's say I studied in Greece and then I wanted to apply to a job in Ireland. I would want to make sure that the Irish employer completely understands the level that I studied at and what grade I got. So I'd be making sure that those international equivalences are really clear. Similarly, if I had a right to work for two years and then I needed to get sponsorship by um, an employer, I'd be trying to make that super, like even including a link somewhere on my CV that explains my visa situation from a government page within that country. That's the type of steps I'd be taking as well to make sure, you know, you're making it really easy for the employer to understand your situation. Like, you know, you're, you're basically taking away all the uncertainty for them. Interesting point. Uh, I, have, I have a last question uh, mm -hmm. about recruiters. Uh, developers, they are very, it's like the, the messages, uh, developers with one plus years of experience they receive, it's really uncanny how many, uh, messages they receive from recruiters but we've seen that that doesn't happen so much on the entry level before you actually get your first real job uh, do you think it's worth uh, for an entry level person to reach out to recruiters uh, what what's your opinion about that so for me right so in ireland you have recruitment agencies and they'll often advertise jobs on their websites so if they have entry level jobs then yeah, I think it's worth reaching out. If they're all very much at the kind of mid to senior level, mm -hmm. it's probably not really worth it. Uh, yeah. But you can always pick up the phone, right? Often recruitment consultants are kind of happy to have a quick chat with people. So you can always pick up the phone and ask them, right? And be like, look, I, I don't have very much experience, but I have all these skills. Is this something that you could help me with? But, but the one thing I would say about recruiters, and I say this to people no matter what industry they're in, is that it can be part of your job search strategy, but I wouldn't rely on them entirely. Um, you know, make sure that you are doing the proactive job search yourself as well. Um, and the other thing is keep your eye on the prize, right? Remember what type of role you're looking for. Recruiters will sometimes suggest other jobs that they have on their books, but that not, might not completely align with what you want from your career. So make sure that you're kind of making choices with your own best interests in mind as well if you are working with a recruiter. 
Awesome, awesome. Thank you. Thank you, Kath, so much for the conversation so far. Uh, I'm learning so much, to be honest. <laughs> uh, I would like to go to the Q&A of, uh, of our attendees. And I would like to start with a question from Vasilios, who asks, uh, should we use a Europass CV template or a more custom CV or a combination? Yeah, that's a really great question. Um, and I think, you know, again, <laughs> my answer is going to be super vague. I think it depends on the country that you're in and what's the norm within that country. And, um, you know, in Ireland, it's not standard to include a photograph on your CV. And a Europass CV has a position for a photograph, so it's kind of weird not to include one. But at the same time, it's not nor it's not the standard in, in Ireland or the UK actually to include a photo on your CV. So that's one thing I would bear in mind is, is checking the norms within the country that you're in. At the same time, I love the Europass formatting. I think it looks great. I think people across Europe or gener like the mainland Europe, I think are fairly used to seeing that um, CV template. So I think if you want a nicely formatted CV and you're within a country that it is normal to include your photograph on it, then I think there's a lot to be said for it. And it's also kind of cool because you can save like different versions of your CV. It's kind of easy to kind of go in and, and, and change it around and stuff like that as well. So um, yeah, just make sure that it's, it's kind of normal and standard within the country that you're applying for. But otherwise, yeah, I think it's great. Uh, would let's say I don't know the norms of Ireland, and I want to apply there. Would it be would it be bad for me to actually put a put a photo there, like, or it's just not needed? So I'll tell you why people don't. Right, is because HR have like you know they they don't want to see personally identifying information that might lead to a discrimination claim down the line. Right, so things like you don't include things like your date of birth. Um, you know, whether or not you're married. Um, and, and I guess also the image is kind of showing how you look and, and what your appearance is, right? So these are all like dimensions that you could potentially be discriminated on. So there's this norm for HR not to want to see any of that at the application stage, although okay. obviously you'd be discriminated on later down the line. But if you were to apply with a Europe Pass CV, it wouldn't rule you out of contention, right? But but I think it is important to understand the norms of the country that you're in at the same time, because I guess in Ireland, people are probably at the moment anyway, and this could always change, right? I mean, we're part of the EU as well, and, and maybe we'll adopt some some more of the, the Europass kind of standard. But um, uh, but but yeah, so I think it's, I don't want to be <laughs> lost my own train of thought. Um, yeah, so I think, yeah, it's important to, to show that you understand business norms within the country that you're in, right? So, for example, if I was applying for, for a job in Greece, I would Google Greece CV template and I'd find a free CV template or a couple of them, right? And I'd look at them and I'd say, okay, well, this is the standard CV in Greece. Maybe I'd show it to one of these guys I'm networking with and say, hey, what do you think about the CV template? Is this the kind of standard or the norm? So, so I'd check that out, right? And, and then I'd make sure that yeah. my CV is fitting within that within that space. Very useful suggestion. I, I, I feel that I have to say that I absolutely dread the Europa CV. It's I, I, I don't know. I just cannot stand it personally. As as a recruiter in our organization, I, I, I don't know. Uh, but I, I respect, obviously, uh, your point of view. Uh, Panayotis Papadopoulos asks, if we want to focus on a global level for remote positions, are there any sites other than for freelancing options? How should we look for this? Um... So they're looking for freelance work, is it? No, they're, they're looking for global level, remote position, uh, job job boards. Um, global, yeah, I mean, I don't know of any that are specialized, but I'm sure there are some. I know, for example, there's a there's some remote jobs boards even within Ireland. Um, so I don't know if there's a global version, I guess my, my sense is that there has to be, if not, I'm going to start one and make millions. Mm -hmm. So there has to be one out there somewhere. I don't know what it is. Right. But, you know, again, I'd be hopping onto Google if that was my priority, remote jobs boards worldwide, or, you know, again, maybe remote jobs boards in the US or whatever. Like, you know, these are the searches that I'd be putting in if, it, if I was doing it. I mean, the other thing is that LinkedIn has a remote uh, filter on it. Right. So you can also filter for jobs on LinkedIn that are remote too. Um, 
uh, an anonymous attendee, I'm, I'm always suggesting that we don't have to be anonymous here. We, we love to see your name and address you directly. So maybe consider it for a next event to join us with your name. And, uh, who asks, which is more important, a CV or a resume? I think they are the, the same thing. So there is there is a difference in the US. So the US have CVs and resumes. And if I'm correct, okay, double check this, guys. But I think the resume is the longer version. So it's more like a kind of a story version almost of your CV. Um, whereas the CV is the shorter kind of snappy bullet points. This is what I did. This is what I achieved. In Ireland and the UK, there's only CVs, right? There is no resumes. So there's no difference. And um, so again, that kind of that comes into understanding the norms of of the country that you're in and, and what recruiters are looking for within that country. I've never um, done careers advising for a country that has resumes and CVs, so I'm not going to be super helpful. <laughs> I only know CVs. <laughs> and we, well, we use them both interchangeably, actually. You know, if a recruiter was to say, send your resume to here in Ireland, you just send your CV, right? So so they're actually the words are used interchangeably in Ireland as well. Yeah. Uh, all right. Uh, Va uh, Vasilios Malios asks about the CV. How many pages has has it has to be, mm -hmm. excluding the portfolio? So that's the first part of the question. I'll get to the second uh, once you tackle that one. Um, so I'm not sure what the portfolio is, but I guess that's an extended kind of discussion of projects that people have been involved in. Would that be fair to say? I, um, I would assume so. Yeah. Okay. Again, look, it depends on the country. In Ireland and the UK, two pages is very standard. Um, you know, I write CVs for people and I always do two page CVs. You know, I think it's it's a nice length like in almost every situation. I mean, if you have almost zero experience, you know, you don't want to be dragging it out over two pages. So, you know, maybe you write a one page CV or if you're in a particular industry like investment banking where a one page CV is kind of standard. That, so there are some exceptions to that norm. But I would say in Ireland and England, the vast majority of, of roles that you're applying for it, two pages is, is very standard. Again, it's like the, the Europass question you asked. If it went over onto a third page, they're not going to rule you out. But the problem is with the six seconds that a recruiter looks at a CV, how sure are you going to be that they're going to find the relevant stuff across three pages, yeah. right? And so, so it's a bit about being kind of aware of that and also making sure that you're putting the information in the right places, right? So... You know, again, if I write a CV for somebody, I've got a profile section that's about four lines at the top of the CV that summarizes my my experience and education in a way that's specific for that job. Right. So the first thing the recruiter says is like, yeah, this person's great for this role. Um, and then I go into, you know, relevant experience or whatever it is. And then at the end, I've got like maybe, you know, additional information or hobbies, but it's definitely the less relevant stuff at the end compared to the start. Um, and then. Yeah, if you're if you're adding on like appendices, like again, like if you have it on GitHub, maybe I'll just include the GitHub link. Um, or yeah, as you said, you can you can include it kind of almost as an appendix to your CV, I guess. Uh, same, uh, same person, Vasilios. Uh, his second question is uh, also if I have a different background, how deep should I go on those jobs? Mm -hmm. I, I assume diverse background, like non-technical background so if i was writing um a cv for a role i would sit down and write a list of all the skills and experiences that they want and i use that as my guide for writing the cv right so remember we talked about transferable skills earlier if some of this non-relevant work experience actually is relevant from a transferable skills perspective use it mm -hmm. right put that weight into your cv if it's totally irrelevant write one line saying what you did so be kind of, you know, again, it's about being intentional and strategic about where you're putting your C your your emphasis in the CV. Like if it's a very technical role where they just want to hear about your coding experience, right? I mean, like go into the projects, go into all the different topics that you cover during your modules, you know, all the rest of it. Um, but, but by and large, in my experience, often they're looking for a range of technical and soft skills. So, you know, just make sure that you're not writing off past experience because it might actually be relevant. But at the same time, sit down and look at your CV and saying, is this sensible? Am I putting the right amount of weight on the right parts of the CV? Like you can have one, like, for example, I just wrote a CV for, for a person today and their first role essentially takes up the entire first page. Right. And all the other things that she's done for the past 10 years before that 
are like one liners because they're not that relevant. So so it's a bit about you know using your judgment in terms mm. of where you find the weight. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, and George asks, when an HR person or recruiter adds an entry level developer with no experience on his LinkedIn network, what are they expecting from us? And what's the purpose of the action? So why does a recruiter connect with a, an entry level developer? What do you think they do that for? Like, so is, is the question, why do they put it up or why are they connecting? What, why are they connecting? Uh, mm -hmm. what, why, why do they have this need to connect with them? What's the purpose of the connection request? Um, yeah. yeah, it's a good question. I mean, if they wanted you for an immediate job, they'd probably say it in, in the introduction email, right, where they reach out to you and say, hey, look, I have this role. I think you'd be great for it. If they don't do that, I mean, you know, maybe they they have a, a goal of, of building their own network for reach, right? So. I mean, I'd like to have a bigger network on LinkedIn. You should all connect with me. Because if I put something on LinkedIn and lots of people like it, the reach is really big, right? And everybody sees it. Mm. So, so like, so one, you know, if they did an immediate job that they were, they wanted you to apply for, they'd probably tell you, right? Secondly, they might be trying to, you know, build their own network to grow their reach. Or or maybe they think that you're putting up stuff that they're interested in and, and you're an interesting person and, and there might be a role down the line for you, right? So mm -hmm. they like recruiters have different motivations as well. And uh, fr from what I've heard from a couple of them is that they, they as you mentioned, they build a network and mm -hmm. they're kind of waiting, watching your progress in your career. And after mm -hmm. two or three years where they have a role, they might uh, come back to you. So so it, networking is good. Networking mm -hmm. is always good. Uh, yeah, I, sorry. Yeah, I think like, you know, from, from my experience of, of people I know who work in IT and, and people I've worked with, I think it is. It's, it's that first job is often the difficult bit in IT. It's it's getting that experience. Yeah. You know, we talked a little bit about that, right? We talked about GitHub and, and, and proving your skills. And we talked about volunteering and other things that you can do there and networking as well. You know, if you make a good connection with somebody and they think you're a great person, they might refer you for that internal role. So there's a couple of things that we talked about there. Um, but I think as you go through your career, particularly in IT, there's like a lot of your job growth will probably come from referrals, right? I mean, you know, IT skills are, are sought after and people tend to move around. And if they thought that you were a good person and they liked working with you, they'll refer you for an internal role, right? So so I do think that, you know, it, it, it is a common thing. And, and as you said, you know, if you have that big network and you're maintaining that network over your career, you know, these things can incrementally like really actually make quite a strong contribution to your career as a whole, right? Because, you know, you'll get more opportunities coming to your door. Awesome. Yours ask, asks another question. How can I reach the, the hidden market that is about 60% of the jobs that are open? This is a top, I brought this that, I, I've I've read somewhere at some point that sixty percent of all job advertisements don't actually get advertised. Uh, so uh, I would love to hear your your take on it. Mm. Yeah. So I I don't know about these statistics. Um, yeah. I, mean, I can I think, tackle the question if you feel like it. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think I mean I think like if we come back to kind of entry level positions, right? I mean, I think most of these, this is, you know, I don't have statistics for this, right? This is my sense. I think yeah. a lot of them are filled through proactive job search and application for roles. Mm. Um, you know, I think maybe at the more experienced levels, you ha you'll have recruiters involved in, in kind of helping to fill positions. But even then, you know, yeah, they'll be reaching out, but they'll often be advertising those roles at the same time, right? I mean, they, they, these companies are usually incentivized to get lots of people to apply because then they have, you know, a bigger pool of people to, to hire from. I mean, I do think that a lot of roles go through internal referrals, but they're often advertised externally too, right? So, mm -hmm. you know, you do also have other things in the hidden market, right? Where you maybe have a small company or like, you know, your experience with these five guys getting this job through the social enterprise, right? I mean, there are kind of happenstance and random things that can happen as well. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think in terms of if I was, you know, a job searcher trying to navigate that, I'd be controlling my controllables, right? Which is, you know, trying to build up that experience, trying to have conversations with people that it makes sense to have conversations with, 
um, and I'd be very like kind of proactive in terms of like, you know, searching for opportunities that are being advertised because that's within your control, right? Um, like there is another piece, right? So there are things called speculative applications where you're applying to a company that doesn't have a job advertised. Um, and, and, you know, people do get jobs through that route. But but I think, again, you probably have to be a bit, bit strategic about who you're approaching, right? I don't think it's necessarily going to work with Google. Not to say you should never do it, right? But but my sense would be it's it's probably less likely to be a successful tactic with a really big, giant multinational. But look, you never know. Um, whereas a small company or a small organization that, you know, maybe, you, you know, you, you have other connections with or an affinity with or you think that they could really benefit from your experience, you know, maybe the opportunities can happen through that type of speculative approach. Or again, maybe it, it's kind of building that relationship for potentially down the line where they go, oh, remember that guy who applied to us last month? He was like, he was great. Let's have a conversation with him. So, you know, sometimes it is about, you know, almost building that relationship for the future or planting a seed of thought. And, and it, it's a bit like what we said about reaching out to people on LinkedIn. You're not necessarily thinking that every, you know, every task that you throw is going to be successful, but, you know, it, it, you know, it can be, again, part of your job search strategy, potentially. And especially at the beginning, as you mentioned, it's very hard to get your first job. Mm -hmm. uh, so you only need one person who, who you network with. But mm -hmm. to get to that one person, you might need to network with tens or even hundreds of people to eventually uh get the introduction or referral or 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 whatever uh kathy i i am looking at the time uh we've we are already two minutes past uh before uh giving you the microphone to tell us how we can reach out to you i would like to acknowledge uh you for your time for the knowledge you shared with you today i i find it very fascinating uh the the second uh career you're going through and uh, looking forward forward to stay in touch and see what's what's uh, the next step for you. Oh, thank you, Damien. It was lovely talking to you guys, and thanks for all the students for joining. And um, yeah, it was a really nice chat, reminding me some things about job search that I probably haven't thought or talked about in a while. So yeah, no, it was really nice to to spend this hour chatting to you all. All right. How, how can uh, how can our students uh, uh, find you? Yeah, so I'm on LinkedIn, so just under Kathy Balf. I know some people have already followed me, so that's been great. Um, and okay. so yeah, LinkedIn is probably the the best place to find me and and to 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 reach out that way. Uh, all right, Zabika thank, says very valuable information. Thank you. Uh, and uh, Dimitar said your LinkedIn for anyone who's who. <laughs> <I'm sorry. laughs> that makes it easier. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, Kathy, thank you very much. Have a lovely evening. Thank you very uh, much. Thanks. Have a nice evening yourself. Bye, everybody. Thanks for having me.